The Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I fought a dog that killed a calf that ate the canary. What is truth? And once again, welcome back. Greetings and welcome. Spring has sprung and the sun shines bright. High atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf where the birds sing, the squirrels scamper, and every day that one crow just glares at me. We have a terrific show for you. Scott McGee is here to talk about his new book, Danger on the Big Screen, which is a history of stunt work in films. You know, a lot of people think that being a stunt man or stunt woman is a very dangerous job, where in the old days people were frequently killed. Well, they're right. And then we're going to talk to a stuntman, a real one, Bob Fisher, a professional stuntman who worked on The Walking Dead, The Vampire Diaries, Stand Against Evil, that's how I know Bob, and a host of other shows. And Bob is here to talk about flipping cars, getting thrown 20 feet in the air, being set on fire. It is a fascinating conversation with a great dude. True Tales from Weirdsville takes a deep dive into the Monty Python's Terry Gilliam. And the time he got into a big fight with Universal Studios over his film Brazil. It got very personal with a guy named Sid Sheinberg. And that fight got very public very quickly. And how it got resolved, well, it ought to be a movie. And now, four quick plugs that will take a total of 14 sentences. Number one, if you're like me and you live in the Vancouver area... I will be performing at the Rio Theater on May 28th as part of the Just for Laughs Festival. I'll be joined by the very funny Drew Landry on that show. Go to danagool.com for tickets, number two. And if you live in the Denver area, I will be at the Comedy Works the weekend of June 23rd. If you enjoy the podcast, you'll also enjoy Hanging with Dr. Z, the second best talk show on the internet to star in Orangutan. It's on YouTube right now. Number three, if you enjoy our True Tales from Weirdsville segment, you'll also enjoy The Cinemorph. Interesting stories behind the scenes of your favorite cult movies and weird shenanigans from the glorified carny camp we call showbiz. Go to danagould.bulletin.com to subscribe. And like the podcast, it's free and worth it. Number four, a big thanks to our Patreon subscribers. The Patreon is how we pay for the show. That way I get to take care of the fine people who put it together. So go to danagool.com for details on all of these fabulous opportunities. And now, it's on to our filthy business. Gould Hour, free and worth it. It is a beautiful sunny spring day here high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. We're here at Falcons Lair Recording Studios. One of the things that's happening in the next week or two here in Hollywood is the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival, which is uh, an annual event that, uh, you know, obviously was uh, remote last year because of COVID. But um, I have a great relationship with the people at Turner Classic Movies. Uh, they're great people. I love their network. It's the reason I still have a dish. And uh, that and me TV. And um, I'm very happy to be joined by a, a good buddy of mine who uh, is the senior director of original programming at TCM. He, he is the man who put Plan 9 on uh, to TCM last year. And he has a new book out called Danger on the Silver Screen. And it is a study of a very underreported aspect of filmmaking, 
stunt work. You know, the people talk about special effects, people talk about makeup, people talk about, but they don't really talk about stunt work. And in the olden days, as we will discuss, people used to die doing it. Um, anyway, please welcome your friend and mine, America's funny uncle in a good way, Scott McGee. <laughs> Dana Gould, this is the sound of my voice. I'll cut the funny uncle comment. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> it is funny because my nieces, I'm a humorous person, so I am literally their funny uncle. What gave you the idea of this book? Because we we just went on a Raiders deep dive because I am I have a big interest in movies that have everything going for them. And they don't work. <laughs> and and that, to me, and I know a lot of more people disagree with me than I thought, was Temple of Doom. Like, Raiders, to me, is a perfect movie. I know people have, if you use the modern lens of, you know, awareness, if you put it on it, it's like, yeah, but it's a cartoon. And it's a great, it's a brilliant cartoon. To me, Temple of Doom, and I saw Temple of Doom on opening night in 1984, and I remember walking up going, that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we ended up watching all of the Raiders movies, and those, you know, th those movies were really homages to the, the stunt work that you're talking about. My first question is, with digital, is there still stunt work? Yes, uh, it, it's a perfect. Uh, it's perfect that you bring up Raiders because it, it is a. It is part of the equation of several different questions regarding this book. It it was the very first film that I saw in the summer of 1981. At you know the ripe old age of 10 years of age, that really uh, spurred my interest in what stunt work was. You know, it, after seeing that film. I, you know, it inspired me to to climb trees and find vines in my backyard and <laughs> swing across them, and it really, yeah. it they, it really captured my imagination, and that and it's it, it stayed with me all you know all the years through growing up to the point where when I was in graduate school, I I I, I wrote a paper on how stunt work in silent films in the films of Harold Lloyd and Douglas Fairbanks and Buster Keaton, uh, how 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 stunt work contributed to those films and to those personas in particular. But a question that that question of whether or not stunt work is still a thing can should still be a thing in the, in the age of digital, you can look at the Indiana Jones series as a perfect, uh, the, the perfect example of, of non-digital and digital Raiders of the Lost Ark. When you see Indiana Jones being doubled uh, or Harrison Ford being doubled by a stuntman named Terry Leonard, literally being dragged underneath a truck. That's a real life human being. And people become more invested, more emotionally involved in the character and in the story when they know that there's a person actually doing that thing. Right. When you compare it though, to the last Indiana Jones, the kingdom of the crystal skull, when they're, I feel my opinion that there was way too much CGI. I've, is it, that a film? I've never seen it. It was the <laughs> no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It, it, I don't was, acknowledge yeah. that films exist. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It takes you out of the movie where you don't. You can feel, tell. You can tell. I don't know don't what feel, it is, and it you, might be our generation. I know I'm. I'm older than you, but um, like with my kids, maybe they don't know because they were raised on it, but. It's you can to me you can always tell and all the stakes go out of it. Exactly, exactly. Now, and there is a way of using CGI digital technology in a way that enhances the practical stunt work, and you see it time and time again in films like Death Proof, where you have uh, stunt woman Zoe Bell hanging on the hood of a car, and she is tethered to a safety line. It's right. digitally erased. It's painted out. But it doesn't erase all of the risk. She's right. still there on the hood of a car going 90 miles an hour. And you know other films like John, the John Wick series or Mission Impossible, for example, with uh, Tom Cruise on the outside of the Burj Khalifa, he had a safety cable tethered. So he wasn't going anywhere. But 
when you have that digital the digital tools to erase the the safety line right there's it, a difference between digitally erasing a safety line and digitally replacing an actor exactly and and the reason why i think stunt work will always be a thing is that again people just can tell the difference between a a a, a one and a zero creation in a computer and an actual human being mad max fury road I think is the best action movie since Raiders. I think it's better than Road Warrior. Um, it's just, it's just stupendous. And and I think like Raiders, the the movie is based on this. The movie is based on the set pieces. Like we want to do this, we want to do this, and 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 sometimes they make that work, and sometimes they don't. Um, but but in in Raiders and and that it it worked perfectly. I mean, the third act of Fury Road is let's go back to where we came from. I mean, it's really antithetical to storytelling. That's right. <laughs> but it and, works. And, but but, it, but I'm glad you brought that up because it George Miller, the director, uh, directed that film Fury Road as a silent film. And when you compare it to the okay. film that he was probably most influenced by and that's buster keaton's 1926 the general has the same structure story structure really? in that film in that film uh, buster keaton plays this locomotive engine or uh, uh, engineer who has to chase after these spies that steal his train that so the story goes in one direction he gets back his train and then it goes back in the other direction just like in fury road wow I, is that the one that he broke his neck on no, that was a film called Sherlock Jr. Okay, because I saw, uh, and he broke, so people don't know that Buster Keaton in the 20s, very famous, and he he had a very strange career because he was around in the 60s, but he had a, he wasn't who he was. He was kind of like, people would see him like, oh, he's still alive? And he yeah. would show up on like the Munsters and Gilligan's Island and and these weird shows and people, and he used to be this. The, like the biggest box office star in the country and he was just kind of hanging around hollywood picking up work because he needed the money i'm sure you know more about the story than i do it's i know a little bit about it yeah he, he his his career went through a lot of ups and downs a lot of you know some depression and alcoholism in the 30s but then uh he rebounded in the 40s and took on a lot of work as a as a gag writer uh and also a character actor in supporting roles in the uh in the 40s and 50s and then really uh, had a new renaissance with the advent of television. And he appears in pretty much everything that you can think of, uh, Twilight Zone episodes. Yes, he's um, in the Twilight Zone. That, yeah. And I think and he's on a Gilligan's Island or a Munsters or something like that. M- might might have been. And he also appeared in uh, the, uh, the some of the Beach Blanket Bingo films. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he had a bit role in uh, Mad 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 World. And one of his last film uh it happened. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Right. And so he died in February 1st of 66. Uh, and, and after he had realized that there was a, a, res, a renewed interest and enthusiasm and acknowledgement that this man was a genius. So well, he, I'm glad, he, yeah, it's good that he lived he to did. see that. I also, well, and for people who don't know about like the famous silent film still of the guy hanging off the clock, that's Buster Keaton. No, that's, that's actually not- hair. That's Harold Lloyd. That's Harold Lloyd. That's Harold Lloyd. <laughs> Buster, I'll cut that. Though. Sounds smart. Buster, though, <laughs> does have the most iconic image, though, of Buster Keaton in the silent era is from a 1928 film called Steamboat Bill Jr. And in the course of that film, there's a there's a a a, a, a hurricane or a cyclone, as they call it in the film. And it decimates this town that Buster is in. And he's battered back and forth. There's giant wind machines that are pushing him down this muddy street. And he ends up dazed, standing in front of this house. And behind him, unbeknownst to him, the wall of this house falls forward. And it looks like it's going to crush him. But because of a open window that is strategically placed, when the wall falls, he's his body it, uh, just passes safely through that open window. It is a it is a breathtaking audacious stunt, and for my money, I think it's the greatest stunt ever made. Because and did they do that? 
practically? I mean, it's, it's, was it hinged? Like, did they know he was going to go through the window or were they hoping? <laughs> no, they knew he and he and his uh, technical director, a guy named Fred Gabori, they had mathematically worked it out. They had engineered it in such a way. And yes, the, the wall was on hinges at the bottom so that right. it would fall straight and true. And right. they, they were also able to engineer it in a way that the wall didn't buckle or bend right. in the wind. And so when it fell, it fell straight. Now, I would have if, shot it backwards. If his math was off, right, he would have he would have been killed instantly. Right. Because as, as as when the wall hits the ground, you can tell there is mass and weight to that. Right. Thing. Wow. And, and, the, and the the great the great thing is that he stays in character. You know, there there's a, right. a stunt a stunt man named Vic Armstrong who said who uh worked on a lot of the Indiana Jones pictures. He said that if he had done that stunt, he would have ruined it because he he would have started immediately fist bumping in the air, having <laughs> <laughs> having completed this awesome stunt. Yeah, that yeah that is the, the that is the um, I I did uh, I was in a show called Mob City that Frank Darabont uh, mm-hmm. uh, did, and I had I did a, a, a not I'm not a stunt man, but I did one thing where I was in a shootout and I had squibs loaded onto my chest and also squibs on the wall behind me. And then after this, everything blew, I had to crawl across the floor and get my gun. And although I was bleeding and they're rigging me with the squibs and, and yeah. And the stunt supervisor is going now when the squibs blow in your chest, you're going to want to turn away from it, but you can't all the way because then the wall's going to go. So you kind of kind of check yourself here. And yeah, the the thing that you forget is that you have to act too. You have to be in character. Now, fortunately, in that, if you just behave normally, you're basically gonna be acting because yep. that's how you'd respond. But then after that, when you're crawling around having been shot looking for your gun, you've got to be what what I did, I had a, a brilliant acting teacher named Leslie Kahn. Uh, I still do. She's not, she's still with us. But she had me literally crawl around the floor. You look like an idiot. But what <laughs> you do is you just do the motion so much that it becomes repetitive and muscle memory, which frees your mind up to get into character. You know, you've got to do these things so many times that it's second nature so you can still think in character. And that's what I mean. Like you to be in character when a wall is falling on you and you're hoping that you don't lose your, literally lose your head is, right. is, uh, is alarming. What, from what I understood how, um, Buster Keaton, um, was it a water tower stunt that he broke his neck? That's right. Yeah. In, that's Sherlock, Ju- in Sherlock Jr. He is on top of a moving locomotive train, a uh, box car and he's he's running along as the as the box car is is uh is moving and as the as the train as he's running out of box car to run on he grabs onto a water spout that that is used to refill the locomotive engine uh and as he as the train uh passes out of frame and he's holding on to that water spout it then lowers and as the water spout lowers the water comes gushing out and the force of the water was such that it 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 pushed him down violently onto the train tracks below. And in the in the shot, it's all one shot. There's no there's no cut. No, there's no cut. He he immediately stands up and runs off of the frame, uh, ending the scene. It was only years later, at, when he was doing a, a medical examination, the doctor took an X ray and said, "When did you break your neck?" Because he noticed a hairline fracture somewhere in the vertebra or what what have you. And Buster said, I did it. And the doctor showed him the fracture and he said, It must have been that train gag uh in Sherlock Jr. That's because he had his 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 neck had hit the train one of the train track rails and it just cracked. Oh, it. that's what it was in the water. It was his It wasn't the water, it was the the blunt trauma of hitting the actual railing of the of the train track. Have stunt people in early, uh, by the way, I love, 
I love that I get the Harold Lloyd thing wrong. I should just fill it with disinformation. A lot of people don't know Buster Keaton, also one of the Marx Brothers. <laughs> one of the only people that was, a, he was in the Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges, and a lot of people don't know it, before Ringo, Harold Lloyd was the drummer. Uh, <laughs> John, Paul, George, and Harold Lloyd. That was the original lineup. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, uh, but I was, it's funny. It was, that was on my mind. I was just up for a role and a thing. And, uh, it was down to me and one other guy. And I tested, we both tested for it. And the other guy got it. And I said to my fiance, I would come in second at the Pete Best Awards. <laughs> like, you didn't win it. I came in second. <laughs> you know, I lost the runner-up contest. Um, it is what it is. Um, this is the business we have chosen, said Hyman Roth. Um, <laughs> did did, did were stunt people in the twenties and thirties before when 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 cinema really was had no rules whatsoever? Did they get killed? Have stunt men gotten killed? Yes, uh, there were a number of injuries, a, no, a number of of, uh, of deaths. Uh, there was probably the most, or I should say one of the most tragic was on a, um, a film called The Trail of 98. And it was an MGM film directed by a, a man named Clarence Brown. And it was shot in Alaska. And the scene called for the stuntmen in uh, two or three boats to shoot uh, a river rapid. And it was a river that had was swollen with the winter thaw. Right. And the the rapid and this this movie exists. You can watch it today. They went down these rapids and uh three, I think, of the stuntmen uh fell out, the the boat capsized, and uh two of the bodies they never found. Ooh. And Ooh. and so it's it's and what things year was like, this? And that, this was uh, nineteen twenty eight, this came out. Another uh, avenue or another uh, subgenre of stunt work in the movies is the aviation picture. Right. Films like, like Wings. Wing, Wings and Hell's Angels and Lilac Time and, and uh, min, many other films. Uh, there were, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird three. Wings, <laughs> Hell's Angels, <laughs> Lilac Time. <laughs> I thought that was the Liberace biopic that's uh, coming out. <laughs> the Scott Thorson story. <laughs> they, these, uh, these aviators, uh, stunt flyers, or as they were often called, precision flyers, okay. uh, they were flying airplanes that were uh, basically milk crates with wings. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they're, so when you have a plane that is in the air, mechanical failure was was frequent. Yeah. And so when when a plane would would come out it would uh, go out of control unless you happened to have a parachute, you were you were dead. I mean, oh. there was just no going back. Oh. And and oh, there God. were there was uh there was one film in particular uh I think it was on Hell's Angels where uh, there was a stunt man or stunt flyer, and in the back of the plane was a uh, another man, an engineer who was there only to uh, up, to, only to throw out this compound that would that would uh, simulate uh, smoke from a from a, a a damaged plane. Right. It was Fake called lamp. It was called lamp black, and so there was this this type of soot. That the that the guy would throw out and, and it would create the smoke. Well, the pilot uh, went into a what they called a controlled dive, right? And it was where you simulate the oh the plane is falling spiraling right. to earth, and he jumps out of the plane. Unfortunately, either he either the engineer didn't hear him or it just didn't get relayed. The guy never never got the message to bail out of the plane. Oh. And so it goes crashing to earth, and he's killed instantly. And and oh, and there were many other instances of uh, flyers for scenes getting tied up in power lines and trees. There was one. There was one flyer, a guy named Omar Locklear, who was uh, flying for a, fi a film called The Skyway Man, which is unfortunately a lost film today. And he uh, was flying and hit an oil derrick and 
died in a, a massive explosion. And he was he was a huge star in the 1920s, Omar Locklear. And uh, it, but but these these kind of accidents were were quite common. Uh, there was one other particular one I'll tell you about. It was a, a film made in the 1930s or 1930, I should say. And it was a, I can't remember the name of the film, but it was being shot over on the coast of Santa Monica. And the scene called for a man to jump out of an airplane and deploy a parachute and then land in the ocean. Well, to capture the scene, there was another plane flying alongside it. Yeah, they, with a camera. <laughs> Right. And in that plane was the the film's director, a man named Kenneth Hawks, who was Howard Hawks's brother. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. In the midst of the of shooting the scene after the the man jumped out out of, out of the after the guy jumped out of the par, of the plane with a parachute, the two planes collided. They got they got connected, hung up and and uh blew up and and uh, landed in the ocean and everybody was killed. So they, they uh, literally like at link with these, uh, yep. these biplanes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh God. And, and, and it was, it was and that those kind of things happened all the time. So it, it, the, the rate of death was very high when it came to aviation stunts. Good God. It is my, and, and some stunts can be like stunts that don't look dangerous. It can be dangerous. I just, because we just watched Raiders and then I was watching the extras, the, the dragging under the truck, which looks uncomfortable, but you wouldn't think it was really dangerous. But, and you, I, I know you know the story, but they said like he had tried that stunt before. Terry Leonard, was that the yep, guy's name? That's him. He, that's him. They, they had tried that stunt before on a movie and it didn't work. And he really wanted to do it. And I think that, I think the stunt was his idea. Mm -hmm. It was. And so th there's not enough clearance under the truck to do that. So they had to dig a however long trench for him to be dragged in. And, but the driver had to drive perfectly straight or he would get pulled out of the trench and run over by the truck. Right. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and the driver can't see him. There was no video tap under the truck showing him where it was. That's um, all true. That's all true. He, the film, the previous film you're speaking of was a film called the legend of the lone ranger and Terry with, with Clinton Spilsbury. That's as right. The lone ranger. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that. I can't <laughs> tell you. <laughs> well, Terry, Terry had uh, duplicated the stunt uh, that Yakima Kanut had done in and and he is the he is the uh, the legend the 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 um, the Jimi Hendrix of stuntmen. <laughs> like, That's right. He, he's right. the guy that you can't top. That guy. He is the grandfather of modern stunt work, Yakima Kanut. And in that film, Stagecoach, he performed a, a famous gag where he is he jumps onto some horses, falls underneath the horses, and then is dragged underneath as the stagecoach the stagecoach fall you know uh, passes over him. Well, with uh, Legend of the Lone Ranger, Terry wanted to hang onto the horses underneath for a few <sighs> seconds longer. <laughs> and unfortunately, the, the horses were also going a tad too fast. And he uh, he got jostled around and eventually uh, let loose, and the wheels of the stagecoach ran over both of his legs. <sighs> broke and so he broke them or... He, he, the, I don't know if he broke them, but he was in the hospital for a while. <sighs> but uh, I think less than a year later, he was on the set of Raiders of the Lost Ark trying it again. Yeah, this these, this this time under a diesel truck. Right. We there is a thing about these guys uh, on on Stand Against Evil. Our stuntman was named Bob Fisher, who's the greatest guy in the world. Follow him on Instagram. He's uh, Stunt Bob or Stunt Bob One. Just the the greatest guy. From Massachusetts, of course. And um, we did, uh, in the first season, again, like a lot of times story ideas come from anybody. And it was, unless I'm mistaken, it was Bob's idea. He was like, let's flip a car. And we were like, can we? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But how does it fit into the story? Uh, let me worry about that. <laughs> you just do what you need to do. So, yeah, we were going to, you know, we flipped a car. And 
you know, that takes months of preparation. They've got to get a car, build it. You know, you have to copy the car that we have, build a cage inside it. You plant a, an explosive charge underneath. There's all sorts of rigging that goes on. But I am the guy in charge. And if anything happens to Robert, it's, it's my fault. <laughs> so the day we shot it, I said to him, like, uh, Bob, if you don't feel like this is 100% safe, I'm telling you right now, I don't want you to do it. Um, and uh, if it is 100% safe, but you don't feel good about it, you don't have to do it. And he said, it was, it was, it was one of those things like, the only problem Bob would have would be if you told him he couldn't do it <laughs> because like, they, no, I'm doing, I'm doing this. And, uh, and, and yeah, it looked great. And he like, you, you understand why they do this. You know, he came out of that thing. Yeah. Pump in the air. And yeah, you understand why they, why they love to do this stuff. Stunt people are there, as I as I say in the book, they are artists, and it, just as much as a cinematographer or a choreographer or an editor or an actor, they these, Very these true. guys are these guys are are not just craftsmen. I mean, they are art artists in in the truest sense of the word. Well, you talk about Raiders, and, and I'll uh, give you another example too. Um, in the movie Jack, the Robin Williams movie, the Francis Ford Coppola film, um, I was there one day and uh the stunt man was doing a stunt for robin where he was falling down a set of stairs and and he was silly but i had to he goes robin basically gave me the character to do the stunt because because you're not just falling down a set of stairs you have to fall down a set of stairs and look like robin williams the way he would fall down a set of stairs harrison ford in raiders uh has a very specific way of fighting like, you know, he has a very specific, as does anyone, has a, you know, same with Keanu Reeves or whoever. People have their own physicality and you have to match it. You know, they're, right. they're, they're actors, they're, they're, you know, actors and, 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 and performers in their own right. Um, one of the pictures on the cover of the book is of uh, the chariot race in, in Ben Hur. Um, that does seem like I don't know how no one was killed during that <laughs> <laughs> well uh no one was uh despite that was yakima was, was on that correct that's correct yeah there are some persistent myths that people were killed nobody was killed on the on the right. set of that film uh it was directed by yakima Kanut and another second unit director named andrew martin oh they do it, they actually directed it as well Yep, they uh, they well yeah Yak did not perform the stunts in that film. Mm -hmm. He was he was the credited co-director in sec in the, of the second unit action for that chariot race. So so that was like a lot of Demille you know, like you do this it's storyboarded out and you do this. It was uh, William Wyler William, director. Of William Wyler directed Ten Ben Hur and Cecil B. Demille directed Ten Commandments. That's correct. And they were both in the Marx Brothers. <laughs> 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 a lot of people don't know Cecil B. DeMille and William Wyler, Mike Nesmith, Peter Torek, the original lineup of the monkeys. <laughs> Just full of misinformation today. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and of course, yes, Charlton why? Heston, famously Henry Fonda's son. <laughs> Yeah, so Marton, <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> Andrew Marton was a famed second unit director who had uh, did the action for films like King Solomon's Mines and uh, Mrs. Miniver and mi many other pictures, and he was hired uh, along with Yakima Kanut to to sort to work in tandem to to mm -hmm. work together to bring this state to to bring this chariot race to to the to the screen. The producer of the film was a guy named Sam Zimbalist, and he said that, "Look, if the chariot race is no good, the picture's no good." That's right. how much was that's how much how much was riding on this chariot race scene, and so it was going to take the combined efforts of both of these men to pull it off. And so, uh, the film the 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 division of labor between the two, I I stated as such that Marton was sort of 
in charge of capturing the action in the camera, whereas uh, Yakima Kanut was was in charge of actually directing the action right. uh, of of the charioteers, of the stuntmen, and of the two actors, uh, uh, Charlton Heston and Stephen Boyd, who did do some of their own driving uh, right. in the chariot race. And and again, like talk about you know having to stay you know, in character. I think that that's probably one of those things where just, if you can drive the chariot, you're going to look like you're driving a chariot. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, a, C, uh, a famous story where Charlton Heston was, he felt comfortable driving the chariot, but he wasn't, he wasn't uh, entirely confident that he would look the part. Mm-hmm. And, and Yakima Kanut said, Chuck, don't worry about winning the race. Just, stay in the damn chariot i'll make sure i'll i'll make sure you win it <laughs> yeah i have nothing but i've said this many times before i uh i mean he i did uh, a tv show with him and with charlton I did, heston yeah i did bill maher's politically incorrect which was the first show and before real time and even then in his late 70s early 80s however old he was it was 1996 or 7 he's a massive physical guy. i mean he's just a huge guy and uh and a gentleman a, a real gentleman um really have nothing but nice things to say about him uh, but yeah i can see like him at his peak in his prime that yeah i wouldn't put anything past his abilities you know? so Ch- chuck heston was doubled in in the chariot race by a, a man named joe Canut, who was yak's youngest son and joe Canut, and he doubled. was i think he was his longtime double i think he uh, I think you went all the way up to because um, I've heard Heston mention that name talking about obviously Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. So I guess he yep. doubled them all the way up, and it would yeah. that would track because they were the same age at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he doubled them in Planet of the Apes. There was a film called The Warlord. Uh, sure, also, also it, with Franklin Schaffner. Oh uh, yes, most famous my, Joe Kinnan and Franklin Schaffner all in the Birds. Not a lot of people know that with Roger McGuinn. <laughs> 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 two of, of the favorite. two of the original three Charlie's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> I, the misinformation my, continues fast and furious here in the Dana Gould Hour. <laughs> one of my favorite gags that uh, <laughs> Joe Canut had doubled uh, for Charlton Heston was uh, A- Airport seventy five, and in that film, Chuck Heston has to be. Uh, I just lower. saw it. I just saw it. Well, it's the scene where he's lowered via a a, 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 cable, a winch, yeah, a winch to uh a, 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 the the nose of a of a moving yeah, into the cockpit of a seven forty seven. Yeah. By the way, and, great idea like, for a movie. <laughs> really great idea. So Joe Canut actually did do that. He was he was uh, oh. dangled dangled behind a, a fast moving helicopter, uh, and was was lowered to just to the to the uh, tip. Of a of a slow moving seven forty seven. This is above the I believe it was above the Rocky Mountains what? over Utah. Yeah, and it is crazy. It was crazy for yeah. for that for that. Uh, era. Also, because they could have put a dummy in the thing, but it had to be one of those things where it was like, no, I want to do it. Well, not only that, but as you said, these stunt men and stunt women, they are in character, and and you mm-hmm. have to you have to be dangled, and you have to move like a like a Chuck Heston would move, and it's. It's not a. It's not something that's easy. Easy to pull off uh, the, convincingly. The, the the only way I know the Planet of the Apes story is, is if there's a he in being interviewed in the documentary behind the Planet of the Apes. Heston tells a story, and that's how I know the name. He goes, it was the scene when they're running. They're before they're hunted by the gorillas. Just before they the hunt scene, they're running through the underbrush out in Malibu Creek State Park, chasing after the primitive humans that stole their stuff and uh and he'd been running all day and at one point it was like the end of the day and and they were going at wa- really wide shots and Heston said uh, i went to my stuntman uh, joe knut uh, joe you want to take these last few runs and he went no <laughs> kind of looked at him and he goes and joe goes you've been running through poison ivy all day <laughs> and he did because he was covered in it <laughs> <laughs> but I also like that they were that they had that that they were such good friends that he could go no, <laughs> and that Heston was the kind of guy that would go oh shit sorry like he, <laughs> but I believe him I totally believe him they, he was like oh Jesus I'm gonna do um, I uh, I actually had a chance to talk to Joe Kanat I I interviewed him over the phone in 2015 uh, I found his address uh, somehow and I wrote him a letter. 
and asked if he would mind being interviewed. And he called me up and he sounds, sounds just like his father. It was eerie. And so I had a delightful conversation with him and he was, you know, stunt. Some people are very humble and, and there's a lot Mm -hmm. of, there's a lot of humility involved in what they do. And well, it tends to be the more you accomplish and the better you are at what you do, the more humble you are because mm -hmm. your work speaks for yourself. Yeah. And you have to be smart to be successful in the long term. In yeah. the long term. People get lucky and they get a lottery ticket sometimes. But you have to be smart to be really good for a long time. Implies that you're also going to know how to behave. Stump people are not daredevils. This is a misnomer. Uh, amongst uh, when it, when uh, when the public considers what a stunt person is, uh, they're not daredevils who are doing it for for attention. Uh, they're doing it for the for the uh, for movie making, for telling a right. story and developing a character. Right. Yeah. That 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 was the, that's the that was the 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 thing that I heard in this uh, um, from the guy doubling Robin. It was like because Robin was playing a kid, uh, it was a, a an adult with a kid's body, and um, he goes, "I had to, I had to be Robin falling down the stairs, you know." And it, yeah, it, it is a, it is a, it's an underrated, underreported element of filmmaking, um, to be sure. Now in the Marvel universe, there's excessive CG. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is obsessed with it. Um, but uh, in fact, all over my I, my youngest is thirteen, and she's in love with Tom Holland. Uh, and I have all over my house. She just printed up and taped. There's ten of them all over the house. Just facts about Tom Holland. <laughs> just like you open the door, and be like, real name Thomas Stanley Holland. And then there's a lot of things like I didn't know. Tom Holland's father Dominic was is a comedian. I didn't know that. He's, he's just like, oh, you do have something in common. With it. But it's but and and again, like in the Spider Man stuff, you can kind of see like, well, that's clearly CG. Um, and it's you know, it does it, it takes you out of it. But there is still there must still be massive stunt work. The John Wick movies are are great examples of uh, I think mo modern use of of excellent. Uh, of of excellent uh, integration of digital because I never feel like I'm looking at fake stuff in those movies, but clearly there's harnesses and 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 what have you uh, pulled out. Very much so. Uh, the first John Wick, well, all the John Wicks are directed by uh, a former stuntman. Guy named oh, I John didn't know Stuff, that. Uh, Chad Stahelski, and uh, the first the first one was co-directed by Chad and his partner uh david leach who's also a former stuntman oh okay well that makes a lot of sense uh and david leach later directed also atomic blonde uh which i also cover in the book oh okay a and atomic blonde much like the john wick films are are you know they they do they they have massive amounts of stunt work that involve heavily the lead actor uh keanu reeves and the john wick and Charlize theron and atomic blonde these these two really went all out in preparing for this role for the for their respective roles of training and of actually doing a lot of the stunt work themselves. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, go ahead. And it was it was it, it's the kind of it's the kind of experience that I think people really respond to in such a visceral way when you see the action on screen and you can tell, yeah, again, there these are actual real life human beings. Uh, going, you know, getting getting bloodied up and bruised, right? In in the completion of some of these fight scenes, yeah. And does Charlize Theron? Does she? Because then you get in this thing you don't think about that up stunt women. You know, there are women that do this. Uh, does she have a specific stunt woman that works with her? Because there's also massive stunts in Fury Road. I'm wondering if does she take the same stunt? Is there a Charlize Theron stunt double? They she the way it works is they usually have one stunt double that that is with them primarily. Sort of works, but with them then all there, time? but then there are specialized stunts that that stunt double may not be best suited for, particularly right. when it comes to driving stunts or anything having to do with high falls or whatnot. And so sometimes they might be doubled by more than one person, uh, especially when you look at a film like Casino Royale with Daniel Craig, 
you in in the opening scene, uh, uh, which was uh, took place on a parkour, parkour, parkour <laughs> on a construction site that that involved two or three different stunt doubles for within that overall scene, right? And, and they do it in a way that is so seamless that you you can't tell. And I also I could be wrong, so you and you would know at the at the opening of Skyfall and the motorcycle chase that there's there's a stunt guy driving the motorcycle. And then they put Daniel, they digitally replaced his face with Daniel Craig's. That's right. They did do and that. And that's a new yeah. element of of uh, of stunt work that I have to say it worked for me. It does. <laughs> I it, didn't it, it know. Does, it does work for me as well because you're not, it's not a, it's not a CGI creation. It's actual right. a person doing that, that gag. Yeah. And, and if, it, if it helps the story, if it helps you suspend disbelief, then by all means do it. Now I will say that once that motorcycle chase ends on the the bed of a moving train, some of that some of those gags were performed by Daniel Craig mm-hmm. uh, on set. Now he was safety tethered, but right. um, but but he did he was he was a hard, he was one of the hardest working Bonds uh, in in movie history. Yeah, and the Bond films actually in the in the seventies really were for a while there until Raiders the the Bond films were the cutting edge of stunts and you would go to the the, the Roger Moore Bond films to see the stunt I know and and I, do you cover the spy who loved me in the in I the did, book I did I sure do Well then sure tell do. tell the story about that opening shot because it's 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 a really interesting story So the opening shot uh there was a man named Rick Sylvester who was a uh, uh, a stunt skier he wasn't right. really a stunt man. He just did these these gags on skis, and he was hired to jump off of this cliff face somewhere up in Canada. And the as the scene for those of you who have not seen, <laughs> with the, the, by the way, me. any any Bond film with Roger Moore when they're skiing, the inserts of the close up inserts of Roger Moore, they're like they're so they're so comical. It worked at the time. I love those movies. I watch them all the time. But like it's so clearly like just him. Like oh excuse me, excuse, <laughs> sorry, darling. <excuse> me. <laughs> it's like the thunder the Thunderbirds had more realistic inserts. Of like, <laughs> <laughs> so so they had they had this guy rick sylvester uh doubling J- uh roger moore and, and so he's on this set of skis and he skis off of a mountain and into into the void and he's in free fall for what seems like an interminable about amount of time deploys a chute and then the chute the parachute is revealed to be the union jack right and then cue, cue the music People applaud. Well, the the making of that scene was it was shot by the second unit director, a guy named John Glenn, who later directed a lot right. of James Bond films in he the eighties. For your eyes only, up to License to Kill. License to Kill, yeah. And uh, it was it was a it was a dicey stunt because a the weather was was very unpredictable. And so they only had a small amount of time to, to pull off this stunt safely. And when the, when Rick Sylvester flies off of the mountain and lets go of his skis, one of the skis after the chute is deployed, almost goes into the parachute. So, and you can't, you can't, you can't completely divorce yourself from those kind of things going wrong. So fortunately, fortunately it, ha- it it worked out, but it's those kind of it's those kind of gags that you can plan and you can minimize the risk as much as possible. But at the end of the day, there's still going to be some risk involved. And from what I remember on the the DVD extras, that's all one shot because right. the other cameras lost him. Yes, that's right. So and that, that is, one that, camera had him, and if that camera didn't have him. We got to go again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was that. That was one of the few stunts that I write about in the book that that were that did not get repeated. It, it was a yeah. one shot deal, uh, just like the Steamboat Bill Junior stunt, uh, the the shot of Yakima Canut and Stagecoach. That that also was uh, it was questionable as to whether or not the cameraman had gotten the whole sh- the whole uh, the whole stunt. 
And uh, John Ford says, well, they better got it. They better have had it because I'm not doing that again. Well, th- We're not that was that a again. story in uh, 2001 in the scene where um, uh, I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing his name, Kier Dulé. I'm sure I did, somehow got it wrong. Um, when he comes back into the airlock without the helmet. Yes. Yes. Um, I think he's falling. It's a, it's a, and I, I don't know if it's Kier Dulé or not. You might. You might know it is it is it is Kier Delay, or right. as Noel Noel Coward said, Kier Delay gone tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, and I think he's falling. I think they did it. However, they did it. Kubrick, obviously famous for 30, 40, 50 takes. Yes, and uh, they did it the first time, and then. I think from what I understand in, in a book I read, like Kubrick started to set it up again. And the I was like, no, that's it. <laughs> you, you got it. <laughs> Unless you want to do it. We're wrapped right. here. Well, and those, those kind of gags are the, the exception to the rule uh, with, with stunt work. It has to be for the most part, it has to be the kind of action that is repeatable. Otherwise it's not, it's not practical to have stunts in the movies. If, if you can't repeat it, and repeat it safely. Right. And this is something. This is something that Yakima Kanut revolutionized when it came to stunt work in the 1930s. He made it in such a way that you can repeat it for the camera if you didn't get it the first time, and, and, or if you have to do it for coverage. What is something that that. Cause, and, and obviously you know about these things, or you wouldn't have written a book because <laughs> you had an interest in it. What what surprised you? What was something you're like, oh, my God, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Well, first of all, I would say about, about stunt people in general is, as I mentioned already, they're very humble and very, very you know, just very humble and gracious people. Mm-hmm. Um, they are very giving of themselves, literally, of their bodies. You know, right. and when, I, when I interviewed Terry Leonard... Uh, I, w- I went to his his house one day uh, when he back back when he lived in Aqua Dulce, California, and the whole time he's sitting in his in a, in an armchair and he's got his he's got his legs uh, draped over the side of the armchair, and the reason why is because his knees had both been replaced, right? And, and would just get, you know gave him chronic pain all the time, right? And this is this is the course of years and, and these years. These guys are like football players; they're just like they're brutalized their bodies. Absolutely, and, and doing absolute punishment to themselves. Yeah. But the but the fact is, is if they got a job tomorrow, they would be right back on set, sure, do, doing the work. And I guess that's the, that's one of the things that that surprised me in terms of their in terms of their character and who they who they were. A lot of them are also very spiritual people. Um, Interesting, you know, not not in an evangelical way, but in in but but they're they're quite. You know they're quite candid about about their spirituality, and that's something that you don't see a lot in Hollywood. And, no, uh, or we're godless that- heathens out here. So. <laughs> so, so that that is that was something that was kind of surprising too. Um, I will say that that one of the surprising details that I had learned in in the cre- in the writing of the book, I, I when I was writing about live and let die the first Roger Moore Bond film. Mm-hmm. That was a, that was one of the first films that employed a lot of black stuntmen. Right. Uh, and in fact, there was a, a man named Eddie Robinson, and, and he might have been the very first credited black stunt performer as a stunt coordinator on that film. And I so I go into a little bit of a sidebar about, in just a very brief history of how uh, uh, African Americans were used in the creation of stunts in motion pictures. Previous to Live and Let Die, there weren't, there wasn't a lot of demand for black stuntmen. Right. Yeah. Primarily because there wasn't a lot of stories being told that involved African American right. stars, and a lot of a lot of times they would be painted down. The white white stunt performers would be would right. wear blackface right. in, in 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 performing these stunts. Well, one of the one of the uh, historical details I ran across was a um, a film from the 1920s, and it was a Thomas Entz production. Sure, Thomas Entz was a very powerful, famous producer, and who had he, a who had a boo boo on a boat. 
That's right. He did have a boo boo <laughs> in a boat, uh, and he he was he was. Uh, he was known for staging, putting a lot of money in staging some elaborate uh, set pieces for for his films. And in one film, it was called uh, Her Reputation. He actually went through the trouble of damming up a portion of the Colorado River in, uh, I believe it was in Arizona. And when and he staged a flood scene, so he built this set, and then at the appointed time, he por- a portion of the dam released the water— flooded the set, and that was the scene. Well, for the scene, he had hired uh, a uh, some local African-Americans to as extras to be in, in the set when the river flooded. And as Thomas Ince's own publicity material stated, a lot of these extras, once they realized what this man was going to do, flooding the, the scene— they balked. It's like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna stand here and get flooded with water. A lot of us can't even swim, and you're talking <laughs> yeah. about the Colorado River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so they they refused to go through the scene, and Entz had a sheriff hold them in, at at gunpoint until the waters rushed in. And it, it's just, it was just jaw dropping what 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 they did. A por- wow. Apparently nobody was apparently nobody was killed. But it's that kind of treatment and that kind of risk. That well, yeah. Well, someone people, was killed on his boat. <laughs> that, right. That's a, that's another story. And there's still uh, a street named after him in Culver City. <laughs> oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. In Boulevard, that goes down to what is uh, used to be RKO, the RKO lot. Um, oh, wow. Uh, where they shot King Kong and Gone with the Wind uh, at the old Culver Studios. Uh, wow. You t- you turn left on Ince. Well, this was this was before the days of Yakima Kanut, where stunts were, you know, it was the, it was there was a very cavalier attitude when it yes. came, when, with certain directors and also certain second unit directors. the The 1925 version of Ben Hur, that chariot race, which is also pretty astounding, yes, was directed directed by a guy named B. Reeves Eason, and he had a very cavalier, reckless attitude when it came to horses. And several horses were indeed killed in the creation of that scene. And I think that that is the origin of the rumor that people were killed during the Ben Hur chariot race. They're thinking of the horses in the other movie, also called Ben Hur. But that's a funny thing that people don't realize. Ben Hur is a remake. That's right. As is the Maltese Falcon. That's right. That's right. Uh, And the 1925 version wasn't even the first. There was a, a 1909 version uh, produced at a studio called Calum. And it involved a chariot race that was staged uh, that involved the Brooklyn Fire Department, of all things, uh, in, in, the, in the creation of their chase. That, that, that's a lost film. But, yeah, it, was, it, was, it had been set, um, staged a couple of times. Wow. Well, here's some weird stunt before we let you go. Here's some weird stunt things that I uh, um, picked up. Uh, you were talking about how the chariot race in Ben Hur, the famous sequence, was not directed by William Wyler. It was directed by uh, Yakima Kanut. The truck chase in Raiders was also directed second unit, right, by a guy named Mickey Moore. Right, and Mickey Moore was a uh, a former actor. All these, been- Yakima Kanut, Ben Hur, Mickey Moore. These all sound like Karnak. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, Yakima Canut. What do you what do you say when someone steps on your canut? (laughs) All of these things are Mickey Moore. What did you hear Minnie screaming through the honeymoon? (laughs) All of these things are just you're lobbing them over the fence. Yeah, Mickey Moore was uh, he was a former uh, child actor. He had appeared in uh, a couple of Tom Mix movies in the 20s. And became an assistant to to Cecil B. DeMille, uh, working on films like The Ten Commandments until he started working as a second unit director. And right. He, he directed second unit for films like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, uh, Patton, and and many more. He he was and he worked uh, well into his uh, into his eighties. Like, all right, have fun. I'm going to be doing this over here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Wow. That is. Uh, so the the name of the book is Danger on the Silver Screen. Mm-hmm. And it uh, is uh, when's it come out? It's out now. It came out April fifth, and it's uh, in stores everywhere. You, if you're in Hollywood, you can go to the Larry Edmonds Bookstore. You can also yes. order it online there. Uh, Barnes and Noble, you can get it there. The, or order the it. great Larry Edmonds Bookstore. The great Long May She Rain. Yeah, and uh, of course Amazon, you can get it there too. They're true. Shocking facts. A 
random Google search describes him as a British filmmaker. But Terry Gilliam was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and grew up in nearby Medicine Lake. When he was 12 years old, his family moved to the good old San Fernando Valley. He graduated from Occidental College, a private liberal arts college in Southern California. He began drawing cartoons for a university publication, and upon graduating, went to work for Mad Magazine's Harvey Kurtzman on a satirical magazine called Help. One of his features at Help was a predecessor to what National Lampoon would later call photo funnies. These were comic strips told in photographs instead of artwork. One of the models in one of Gilliam's more famous photo cartoon strips was a British sketch comedian named John Cleese, who was in America for a stage show review of a sketch group that he was in called the Cambridge Circus. Cleese starred in a photo series telling a tale of a man who falls in love with his daughter's Barbie doll. So we're now moving into the late 1960s, and Terry Gilliam was noticing a change in the tone of civil discourse in America. He predicted, quite accurately, that things were about to get bad. In a 2003 interview with writer Salman Rushdie, Gilliam said it was the beginning of really bad times in America. It was 1966, 1967. It was the first police riot in Los Angeles. I drove around in this little Hillman Minx, which is a British car. And every night I'd be hauled over by the cops, up against the wall, all this stuff. They had this monologue with me. It was never a dialogue. It was that I was this long-haired drug addict living off some rich guy's foolish daughter. And I said, no, I work in advertising. I make twice as much as you do. Which is a stupid thing to say to a cop. But it was like an epiphany. I suddenly felt what it was like to be a black or a Mexican kid living in Los Angeles. Before that, I thought I knew what the world was like. I thought I knew what poor people were. And then suddenly it all changed because of that simple thing of being brutalized by cops. And I got more and more angry and I just felt, I gotta get out of here. I'm a better cartoonist than I am a bomb maker. Gilliam moved to England where he worked as an animator on a kids TV show called Do Not Adjust Your TV Set. The show featured among other people, Terry Jones, Eric Idle, and Michael Palin. After the success of Do Not Adjust Your Set, the group received an offer from the BBC to develop a sketch show that was not aimed at children. Gilliam's old contact John Cleese joined the group, as well as a guy named Graham Chapman. And after several rejected titles were tried on and discarded, my favorite among them was Owl Stretching Time, the group settled on Monty Python's Flying Circus. The show premiered on BBC One on October 5th, 1969, and went on to become a global phenomenon. If not inventing, then certainly putting the patent on an absurdist type of sketch comedy that to this day remains unparalleled in its consistency. Mr. Show, in my opinion, is up there, but you cannot touch the original. Part of the genius of Python was that they devised a format that allowed them to circumvent the traditional sweaty ending to sketches by simply cutting away from them when the funniest beat had played. This was made possible by the strange animated interstitials created by Terry Gilliam. His style, Victorian photographs cut out and crudely animated, provide not only a brilliant way to cut in and out of sketches whenever they felt like it, but it also gave the show its signature visual look, a photographic style and graphic font that remains immediately identifiable to this day. In the early days of Python, Gilliam was of, but apart from the group. But soon, the only American became a full member. Between Monty Python's third and final seasons, the group conceived of a movie. Now, they had released one film previously called And Now for Something Completely Different, which was a compilation of refilmed sketches designed primarily to introduce the group to other parts of the English-speaking world. They had begun to air on PBS in America, and they were beginning to catch on. So the Pythons devised a script around the search for the Holy Grail, 
The film would be co-directed by Terry Gilliam and fellow Python Terry Jones. It was financed primarily by, and this is true, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and Jethro Tull. The tax system in England had gotten to the point that many of the country's rock royalty, suddenly flush with instant tsunamis of cash, had been elevated to the 90% tax bracket. So investing in films was a great tax write-off. And since they were all fans of the Pythons, this was what we call a mutually beneficial situation. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was released in America in April of 1975. Now by now, thanks to PBS, everyone knew who Monty Python was, or what Monty Python was, although a lot of people thought it was a dude. And the film was, by all definitions, a hit. The reviews were mostly favorable, but the film was clearly ahead of its time. Gene Siskel, notably, gave it two and a half stars saying, it contained about 10 very funny moments and 70 minutes of silence. Too many of the jokes took too long to set up, a trait it shared with both Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. Okay, so you don't like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Young Frankenstein, or Blazing Saddles. But outside of that, you were a fan of comedies. All right. For the record, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail currently sits at 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, as well it should. Following the Holy Grail, Gilliam set out to direct a film of his own. He wanted to distinguish himself from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which was a comedy set in medieval times starring the members of Monty Python. So he made Jabberwocky, a comedy set in medieval times starring Michael Palin from Monty Python. Anyway, as the story goes, during the press tour for the Holy Grail, someone asked the Pythons if they had any ideas for a follow-up movie, and Eric Idle joked it would be called Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory. Everybody laughed and then got to thinking, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea. The resulting film, Monty Python's Life of Brian, is not about Jesus Christ. The film tells the story of a man born at the same time and the same place and is thought to be the Messiah, but is not, nor does he want to be. The film was to be financed through the British entertainment conglomerate EMI. Just days before filming started, some say as close to two days before filming started, the chairman of EMI, Lord Bernard Delfont, finally read the script and was horrified and pulled out of the project. The Pythons needed money fast. They had had great success with rock stars previously, so why not try that again? Eric Idle called the richest person he knew, George Harrison. After conferring with his business partner, Dennis O'Brien, Harrison took out a loan, putting up Friar Park, his home, as collateral. Together, Harrison and O'Brien formed a production company to finance Life of Brian called Handmade Films. It was a wise investment. Brian made back five times its budget, and Handmade Films went on to become a major force in the British film industry. In the wake of Life of Brian's success, Handmade Films' Dennis O'Brien asked Gilliam if he had any other ideas that he would like to direct. Gilliam told O'Brien of a story he had about a young boy who travels through time, meeting all of history's great heroes, and how, one by one, those heroes disappoint him. O'Brien loved the idea. The resulting film was called Time Bandits, and it was a smash hit. Terry Gilliam was now a big, hot property. Hollywood was calling. Gilliam, of course, hated Hollywood. His low opinion of the studios was reinforced by the fact that none of the majors, despite his reputation with Monty Python, would go near Time Bandits with a 10-foot pole. Eventually, O'Brien got a small outfit called Avco Embassy Pictures to release Time Bandits. Avco Embassy's last big hit was another film no studio was interested in called The Graduate. Gilliam came to Hollywood. He knew what he wanted his next movie to be. It was inspired by the calendar. 1984 was looming large. 
Now, those who haven't seen Brazil in a while may simply remember its brilliant design, its brilliant art direction, which now, of course, we would call Gilliam-esque. But the story is compelling. Gilliam wanted to tell the story of an innocent guy, an ineffectual everyman named Sam Lowry, who lives in a totalitarian future society. Lowry is a low-level government functionary who deals with the drudgery of life by escaping into an elaborate fantasy world, where he is a winged warrior saving a beautiful damsel in distress from sinister forces. But one day, Sam's real life gets interesting. The city Sam lives in is frequently the target of terrorist bombings. These are done to protest the government's oppressive police state tactics. Now, of course, the government deals with them by convincing the public that the only way they'll stay safe is with more oppressive police state tactics. Sound familiar? Anyway, one of the main terrorists that the government is looking for is a renegade heating duct repairman named Archibald Tuttle. Tuttle is wanted for arrest, but a fly gets stuck in a teletype machine and a man named Archibald Buttle is arrested instead. Buttle dies while being tortured, and, as is custom, his family is then billed for the expenses. Lowry notices this and hand-delivers a refund check to Buttle's grieving family. There, he meets their upstairs neighbor, a truck driver named Jill Layton, who just happens to be a dead ringer for the woman in his fantasy. Jack becomes obsessed with Jill, no surprise, but Jill has also been helping the Buttle family find out what happened to Archie. But since the government said Buttle was a terrorist, even though they were looking for Tuttle, well then Buttle must also be a terrorist. Otherwise, the government would have to admit that it made a mistake, which it can't. Therefore, anyone trying to help Buttle's family must also be a terrorist. And so begins the journey of... Well, Jack and Jill. Gilliam pitched the story around Hollywood and, after the normal false starts and back and forthing, ended up making a deal with producer Arnon Milshon. The film would be released internationally by 20th Century Fox and in America by Universal Studios. The final cut of Brazil ran 142 minutes. This version was released in Europe by 20th Century Fox without incident. But when it was screened for the executives at Universal Studios, a mighty not so fast rang out. And it rang out from the offices of Universal Studios president and CEO, Sid Sheinberg. Brazil was screened for an audience at the Directors Guild. And the comment cards showed two thirds of the audience loved it and a third of the audience hated it. For the record, Scheinberg's boss, the legendary Lou Wasserman, walked out of the screening claiming the film to be unreleasable. Scheinberg wanted to make some cuts to the film before Universal released it. And also, while they were at it, give the film a happier ending. Gilliam responded, This is the film we agreed to make. The ending is non-negotiable. Scheinberg was not used to this. For one thing, he had a reputation as a very director-friendly executive. It was Sid Scheinberg who screened a 20-minute student film called Amblin and signed its director, a 21-year-old kid named Steven Spielberg, to a seven-year contract directing television for Universal. When Spielberg's second feature, Jaws, ran fantastically over schedule and budget, it was Sid Scheinberg who had the director's back. It probably helped that Scheinberg's wife, Lorraine Gary, was in the film, portraying Mrs. Brody. I mean, what executive is going to pull the plug on a movie his wife is in? Undaunted, if a little thrown, Scheinberg appealed to Gilliam's reasoning, saying that if they could prove to him that a happy ending would improve the film's test scores, then obviously you'd agree to make the change, right? Gilliam said he'd burn the negative and the building. And so began what came to be known as 
the Battle of Brazil. Now, the fact of the matter is, of all the executives at Universal, Scheinberg may have had the highest opinion of the film. Most of them, notably people like Frank Price, chairman of the Motion Picture Group, and Marvin Antonowski, head of marketing, they all believed that Brazil was a very good art house film. But that was it. It was what it was. It was an art house film, with an art house film's appeal and an art house film's financial expectations. Scheinberg felt that by making the movie shorter, more accessible, and to give it a happier ending, he could actually turn it into a successful film with a wide audience appeal. It's like someone gives you a shot of whiskey, really great whiskey, and you like it, but you realize that more people like lemonade. So you start fucking with the whiskey to try to turn it into lemonade. And what you're really going to end up with is really shitty whiskey. Terry Gilliam was determined that that not happened to Brazil. Frank Price and Marvin Antonowski believed that if you had whiskey, that's what you served. Sid Scheinberg thought, when Terry Gilliam gives you Brazil, you make lemonade. Gilliam called Steven Spielberg and asked if he would see the movie, knowing that the director had Scheinberg's ear. Spielberg recognized that the film was a work of brilliance, but appears to have stayed out of the fracas, at least publicly. What was hanging Gilliam up was the running time. He was contracted with Universal to deliver a film no longer than 125 minutes or less. That would allow theaters to have two shows a night at decent times, which is important when your film is not a big matinee draw, as no one assumed Brazil was. The international cut was 142 minutes, and Gilliam was happy with it. Universal was not. And if Gilliam failed to meet his contractual obligation to turn in the film at a certain length, then he forfeited his right to final cut, and Universal was then allowed to go in and recut the film. So why didn't Gilliam just deliver the film under 125 minutes? It would seem that he didn't want to cut a frame that hurt the film, and he just could not get it to 125 minutes. He did get the film down to 132 minutes. And though Scheinberg was encouraged, he still wasn't satisfied. You have to realize that these two guys are the opposite sides of the same coin. It's show, business. Terry Gilliam is show, and Sid Scheinberg was business, and neither one of them could understand the other. Terry was a 60s radical, and Scheinberg was an 80s business dude. It wasn't, I'm right, you're wrong. It was, I'm right, you're insane. To prove Scheinberg's view of him, Terry Gilliam had named the production entity responsible for Brazil, Poo Poo Pictures. So all of these high-end contract and documents representing the movement of millions of dollars all came on Poo Poo Pictures letterhead, and lawyers would have to say stuff like about the Poo Poo Pictures contract. Gilliam thought this was hilarious. Scheinberg said, and I quote, What kind of person does business like this? As the back and forth commenced, Scheinberg pulled Brazil off of Universal's release schedule and set a team of editors to work recutting the film. Occasionally, the editors would call up Gilliam, who lived in London, for guidance, and they were stunned when he refused to help them. In Jack Matthews' excellent book, The Battle for Brazil, which is obviously where I got most of this, Gilliam said their questions were like, hey, we're cutting up your child. Should we cut off the left leg or the right leg? And they were surprised when I refused to help them. It turned into a very high-profile pissing contest. Scheinberg had often repeated that he had a reputation as a very director-friendly executive. This was important for Universal as well, to be seen as an artist-friendly studio. Talent is the currency of show business, and if talent doesn't want to work with you, then you don't get a lot of talent and you can't do business. Again, according to Jack Matthews' book, Gilliam surmised that Scheinberg said this so often that it was a tell. 
Gilliam felt that Scheinberg was probably insecure about this, and so Gilliam took out a full-page ad in Variety with ornate black borders looking like a funeral announcement. The ad read, Dear Sid Scheinberg, when are you going to release my film Brazil? Terry Gilliam. Now, as anyone will tell you, the only response to fuck you is fuck you too. And the battle raged on. As Sid Scheinberg worked away on his cut of Brazil, which would eventually come in at 93 minutes and be known as the Love Conquers All cut, the film was shown on television and you can see it on the Criterion Collection issue of Brazil and you really should see it. And it's amazing how terrible it is. Anyway, while Scheinberg was supervising that cut, Gilliam was invited to speak at the USC Film School. He wanted to show his cut of the film, but it was in violation of his contract with Universal for an hour. Gilliam went back and forth from the stage of the lecture hall to the phone off stage where he was literally arguing with Universal's lawyers who refused to let the film be shown. And then he would go back on stage, say what the lawyer said, go back to the phone. Gilliam quite accurately told the students that they were getting a very clear view of what a director's life was like. Most of it was just arguing with lawyers and studios. For whatever reason, the following night, the film screened at Cal Arts. Now, either Universal had not heard about the screening or they decided that it wasn't worth the bother, but Gilliam showed it. His new 132-minute cut, twice. And in the audience, in addition to Cal Arts students, were a small group of Los Angeles film critics. The following night, Gilliam showed the film again in a private screening room of 20th Century Fox's chairman, Alan Hirschfeld. In the audience, primarily film critics. A couple days later, Gilliam appeared on the CBS Morning News with Robert De Niro, of all people, who appears in the film in a small but pivotal role. He plays Tuttle. While the interview did nothing for his legal predicament, it served as a public relations boon, casting Gilliam's fight against Universal in David and Goliath terms, where David was that plucky guy from Monty Python, who was friends with Robert De Niro. We love him. And Goliath was a faceless corporation named Universal. At least they thought it was a faceless corporation, until Gilliam said, I don't have a problem with Universal. I have a problem with one man, Sid Scheinberg. He then removed an 8x10 photo of Scheinberg from his jacket and held it up to the camera. Scheinberg fired back in the Los Angeles Times, reminding readers that Gilliam was not yet Picasso. He's not yet Steven Spielberg or George Lucas or Sidney Pollack. He hasn't won any Academy Awards. He went on to say, I don't think I'm in a war. I'm not a cold piece of meat. I know he's devoted to this that the minutes to him are as important as the money is to us? I am of this business. I am of this process. And I'm arrogant enough to think I'm as creative as the next guy. Well, that is where he was wrong. The next guy was Terry Gilliam, and he was pretty fucking creative. Now, there's no doubt that Sidney Scheinberg was a brilliant creative person, with an amazing eye for talent, but believing himself to be just as qualified to recut Terry Gilliam's movie as Terry himself was an act of hubris, and there was plenty to go around in this story. And eventually, this hubris bit him in the ass. Now remember, remember before that the small handful of screenings in Los Angeles were populated by a large number of film critics. As awards season approached, the studios lined up their top films for consideration. Universal's big film that year was Sidney Pollock's Out of Africa. There was also Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple, John Huston's Pritzi's Honor, and Akira Kurosawa's Ron. It was fitting that the Los Angeles film critics met to vote on their 1985 awards in a conference room at the Beverly Hills Gun Club, for they fired a shot heard round the cinematic world. Best Script, Best Director, and Best Picture all went to Terry Gilliam's Brazil. 
a film that had not yet been released. According to Jack Matthews, in the Battle of Brazil, Terry Gilliam was understandably euphoric and correctly assumed that there was no way now for the studio to hold out on releasing Brazil. Sid Sheinberg's response was more intriguing. When he was told of the L.A. film critics' vote, he paused and said, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And now, on with the show. So I'm interviewing Scott McGee about his book, Danger on the Silver Screen, which is really well-researched and entertaining history of Hollywood stunts. And you start to think, who becomes a stuntman? Who becomes a stuntman and why? And what is that life like? And then I realize, wait a minute, I know a stuntman. And uh, so I uh, called him up. That's the problem when you have a friend who has a podcast you have to screen your calls. And if you inadvertently answer, you're going to get an invitation. Um, Bob Fisher uh, is a professional stuntman who uh, was the stunt coordinator and uh, lead stuntman on the show, among many shows, Stand Against Evil. That's how we get to know uh, each other. And um, he's also a mass hole. So right out of the gate, we can talk about Channel 56 till the day oh, is long. <laughs> right out of the gate. <laughs> but um, in the story that I told uh, earlier in the podcast about uh, when we flipped a car, uh, it was Bob's idea and Bob was in the car. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to talk to him. Hi, Bob. Nice to see you again. It's great to see you again, Dana. Thanks for having me. Um, and so that is that is a question that we were, we worked together for three years, and I never asked you. I was very into myself back then. Uh, how does one become a stuntman? Is that something you set out to do, or did you, no pun intended, fall into it? Uh, I unfortunately uh, sought it out. I searched for it um, for a long time. Um, Not unlike, say, Evil Knievel, you just had the had a, the Daredevil yen. Uh yeah, I guess I did. I, th I think I think so. Growing up and being a mass hole in Western Massachusetts with now, where did you grow? Where did you? You were in Western Mass. Where Where are you from? Actually, uh, I grew up in a little town called Sheffield, in the very yeah, bottom of the corner of the state. Berkshires okay. in the Berkshires, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I went um, to UMass been there so many times soccer camps at umass uh, mm -hmm. growing up uh folks split up moved out uh when i was 18 after high school moved to colorado uh had no i had no idea what i was going to do i knew that right. if i stayed i was going to get locked up or end up working at a mill and right i don't know which right. is works yeah yeah um so i Went out west, and in between a couple of the winters, I, I went down to Dallas, Texas, where my dad was living, and he kind of knew somebody who knew somebody. I started to work out with these guys and to, went to learn that I needed to maybe do some live shows at Disney or wherever I could find work that way, uh, which is basically how I got in the business. I started doing live shows, and then that's paid training, really, is what right. it is. At like Orlando or at Universal Studios or yeah, and and how, where did you go? Florida or Florida? Yes, sir. Uh huh. And which ended up, of course, bringing me to Georgia for uh, Six Flags and the Batman Show for a number of years. And <laughs> so, so what was the? You're in uh, your first show. Is it like the the Water World stunt show or the Indiana Jones stunt show? What is your what is your, what's your first? Uh, in front of an the audience. very first was a, a thing called the superhero salute at Universal. Uh, also was, a sex move. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Uh, uh, it's funny because nobody knew who Daredevil was. So I was the running joke was after three or four days of us performing to people, I was then Daredevil 
not man without fear, but daredevil man without a job. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cause they cut that part pretty quick, which is funny, but I, I immediately picked up six flags had uh, the Batman stunt show, Warner brothers stuff. Right. So that was my first real, real foray into doing a lot of the, the action stuff. And now are you, are you Batman or are you oh, uh, no. a henchman? Not with this face, Danny. You should know that. Um, well, he wears a henchman more likely. Uh, I was an audience plant. Uh, I ended oh, okay. up playing multiple parts. Uh, secretly, used the driver for the Batmobile at the end, and uh, so I got a yeah. It was perfect role for a kid from Western Mass sure. with too much ADHD and <laughs> way well, too high. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So how many how many shows a day? do you do when you're doing that? we were doing i think we did five a day yeah on busy days i did one that's one thing you forget i did a i did this thing called hollywood hell house which was a haunted house maze but what it was was the southern baptist church did a christian haunted house so it's like every scenario was like a girl uh taking drugs at a party and getting uh assaulted then having an abortion, then you know <laughs> wow. that was the on and out. And um, I was, uh, yeah, and, and you forget, like, oh yeah, no, you just do this, and then you reset it, you do it again. We did like four or five times a night. Wow. Um, and, but that is like with explosions and noise and smoke, and yeah. But if you, as yeah. you say, you have ADHD. Do did you do you find did you ever stop to wonder if somehow the adrenaline jolt leveled you out? And as a result, you sought out the adrenaline jolt, and that's why you have such a proclivity for it. You know, that's an interesting way to look at it. I never really thought of that. Uh, the upside of having ADHD, uh, especially as an adult now, is hyper focus. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the moment of something, getting thrown in a grave or a ditch <laughs> or blown up out of said grave or ditch, uh, <laughs> the moment is just very, very clear. The adrenaline probably does level you out. Uh, now that I think about it, it's not something I think I chase or really did chase. Uh huh. Uh, that was more of my free time. Uh, <laughs> sure. No, enough general said. Mis misbehavior. Sure. We're all men of the world. Mm -hmm. Um. So you're you're then you're you're at Six Flags and and that's in it's all in Florida. Uh, no, this was up here in uh, just outside of Atlanta. Okay. Uh, not, oh, okay. Okay. That, we... that, right. And then you. Yeah. Uh, when did when did working in film when did working in film start? for you uh 94 uh, i did a, a movie down in sonoya a period piece uh called andersonville about a, a southern prisoner of war camp uh, mm, i during, think i remember that film yeah a uh, famous book right uh, um but great opportunity had no idea what i was doing first thing uh on set standing by with my bag at my feet just waiting for somebody to tell me what to do and uh, this young guy walks up uh introduces himself uh, to myself and a couple of the people and says, so who are you? What are you doing? I s believe I'm your stunt double. It immediately went south from there. Uh, I don't need any damn oh, no. stunt who, who, double. Was this a famous uh, person or? Uh, no, he wasn't. Uh, Emmy winning Broadway or a uh, uh, theater actor for sure. This was, I think his first foray into but film. You, but you do want a stunt double. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, they were running a horse in that literally skids up to me and rears over above me. So they wanted him not to be underneath that, no matter how trained the horse was. And it was. Yeah. Uh, but, but the most horrible moment is my very first five minutes on set. And I'm getting screamed at by a guy I've never met before. Right. And then uh, Bud Davis, who was the stunt coordinator, who just finished a little full film called Forrest Gump, right, <laughs> uh, was there. And he put his hand on my shoulder and turned me around. And we started to walk away. And I just thought, wow, I'm so sorry about that. So now nah, it happens. We're just not going to share the sandbox with them. Well, we'll stay over here in our own little world. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a great lesson learned that you're, you're, you know, not always going to make friends with people when you work. So, I find that so bizarre. Like who? Uh, I, I don't know. And it, but it, again, then it bothered me. You know, but but you ended up, old. I'm so, I'm assuming you ended up doubling him. Okay. Yeah, it was a great double for him. Uh, everything that way worked out. We just didn't ever cross paths from that yeah i think this probably for an insecure you know for an insecure person i.e an actor that would be like no i don't need a stunt double and if you are secure you go no 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 come on in <laughs> yeah let's uh, have at you know, it again i'm gonna have some iced tea over here 
<laughs> fine. My job is purely to make you look good. Yeah. Uh, even if it's being beaten up or looking horrible while you're doing, you know, whatever that thing is. Well, yeah. And in, re- in doing in reading Scott's book and, and researching this a little bit, like here's a story that I didn't know. Um, in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Harrison Ford really effed up his back doing just a stage fight, like nothing, not a jump or just a, a stage fight. And he was out for like over a month and they had to shut down. Then they re and then they, they shot a lot of that film with his stunt double. Yes. And, and they were like well beyond stunt work. Like he was just doubling him in scenes and they were just, sh- cause they had to keep shooting. They had to keep working. And then when he came back and then it was just insert, 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 it put him back in the movie. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so you actually, your responsibility is uh, to ensure that the production can go forward if, if an actor's, you know, not only not able to do a stunt, but just can't be there because of a physical impairment or something. A flip side of that, uh, John C. McGinley, uh, mm-hmm. that guy. I am well aware of Mr. McGinley. Uh, yeah, you've heard of him. Uh, John was just, when John wanted to do it and we talked about it, John did it. When John felt it was not necessary or we're into our 12th or 14th hour and he's just tired of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Bob, do you mind? Not at all. Yeah, uh, because uh, he's not insecure. <laughs> he's, he, knows, he's, he knows exactly who he is, and he's a pro. In any of his vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Have at it. Yeah, no, John's a, John's a good egg. Um, so, and and now uh, you get established and you're working in Atlanta. Do you, do you think that you... Is there... There's still as much production in Atlanta now as there was five years ago, I'm assuming. More so. More so now, yeah. Yes. And uh, are you at the point now where you just work when you want to? No, no. Uh, I've never, uh, I guess, you know, again, coming into the business and having to learn so much over such a long period of time, uh, I never, so one of the uh, unwritten rules is don't turn work down. Right. Uh, you don't have any work, don't turn anything down. Uh, and then when work appears, um, you know, if you make that promise to be there, be there. And so, I, no, I still... Uh, I just wrapped uh, on a TV show that I coordinate now in town. They're finished Saturday, but I was done early. I'm taking a little bit of time, uh, Mm -hmm. spend some time with Holly. Uh, We're working on the house, uh, see the kids a little bit more while they're at college and whenever they give us their five minutes. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm familiar. (laughs) But I'm familiar. uh, Friends, friends invariably will reach out looking for, you know, somebody with my rigging skills or or just another body sometimes. So I try not to turn those down when that opportunity presents itself. Now, what is going on? I know one of the, one of the leading employers of stunt people in your neck of the woods was the, uh, the walking dead. Um, Now that I, the Walking Dead wrapped, <laughs> but is it? Is there another? Is there like Walking Dead goes Hawaiian that spin off and is still going? Or there's a couple. I don't know what happens with the second one that they were shooting down in Mexico. Uh, they have one that shot. I know it's two seasons now, maybe three. Uh, World's End, or that's in Virginia. Oh, that's I in believe. Virginia. It's not in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, but same show, same idea, same concept. Right. I think it's uh, what's it like to be a child growing up in this world, and as these kids are coming of age, kind oh, of. That's thing. interesting. Very, yeah, very interesting idea. Uh, I've gotten to work on that a couple of times. Great, great coordinator crew and uh, actors and everybody. But yeah, there's something that is shooting here, and I don't know if it's a a web series or something, but it's it's backed by them. Okay. I know yeah. Because uh, I know that Creep Show is in Vancouver now. Did they take it to Vancouver? Yeah, they took it to Vancouver. Great. You got some kind of tax, some kind of tax. Yeah, it's always about the tax deal. Yeah, it's uh, always about the tax rebate. Um, so when uh, we met originally, when you came to uh, work on uh, Stand Against Evil on uh, on the independent film channel, as Bob Goldthwait calls it, the Witness Protection Program of Television Networks. Um, <laughs> you, you know, yeah, we. I was always. I, I can say, like, I was always leery of. Stuff because you know when you're the like if any if anything goes wrong it's my fault 
It doesn't even matter if I don't even have to be there for it to be my fault. Right. Um, you know, and the, you're the, you're the, where the buck stops. Um, and I was telling this story about when you guys wanted to flip the car and I said, uh, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And you looked at me like, if you try to stop me from doing this, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> I'm assuming that when you get into a big stunt, that there is an anticipation and there is an adrenaline. And you really, absolutely, have to, you have to finish it. Give us, give us some insight and in whether it was that. Well, let's talk about the car flip since that's, I believe, it was your idea. Like we can flip a car. Um, what goes into something like that? Uh Wow. Uh, so much went into that Fa from the fabrication of the cage to make sure it was safe. Because first off, you, you all gave me just enough creative license to hang myself. So to speak. <laughs> uh, but Always you, also, our goal. <laughs> you also followed it up with um, fairly consistently. We don't want anything happening to you. This isn't, you know, it, this yeah. would be great. No one's going to see this. It's on IFC. We, yeah. We would much <laughs> rather not if, if there's a chance of injury. So with the fabrication and uh, Ed Tapia giving me the opportunity to do this yourself, there was no way I was going to screw it up. Uh, I turned over a couple of cars before, but this was my first on-camera pipe ramp. Is that, that's uh, what it's called, a, a pipe ramp? Yeah, what we used was the pipe ramp. So okay. uh, just the, Also the, a sex move. <laughs> <laughs> How are these things not sex moves? <laughs> <laughs> just the time to... Prep it, everything, the car. I think we had seven days to get a roll cage put in it. Right. And and the car itself, like, if you people haven't seen the show, the, you know, the car in the show, the show had an amorphous time in which it took place. Like the, we, we, did, we did it intentionally by like, it was purportedly modern day, but there were rotary telephones, old mm -hmm. TV sets, old, it was this vague 70s kind of vibe to it. But they had cell phones when we needed them to, <laughs> or you know, it's like I tried to keep it spooky and weird. And um, I wanted to, do that. and so they drove like a 70s wood paneled station wagon, and somehow we found a copy or a car that looked enough like it exactly like it, as yeah. a matter of fact. Uh, and the it, family truckster, yeah, and it ran, which was the other miracle, or did we? have to get it to run <laughs> uh i think the the picture car guys had to give it a little tune-up i believe it did run it was not the best running car no, I, don't, I don't know if you ever found if out you're gonna uh, flip a car this is a good one because odds are it runs as well upside down as it does right side up <laughs> it rode really great upside down uh so we get the cage fabricated we get everything ready and it's the only thing I can do to prep for this, other than having prior knowledge of how to turn a car upside down, right, was a speed run for camera for everybody, so that everybody understood this is roughly what we felt the speed was going to be. We were able to do that quickly, and then uh, just hitting the ramp. It, it's it's really as dumb as it sounds. It's, it's really quite simple. Uh, you carry a specific speed, and you line the car up in a very right. specific place, and you do certain things when you can at the moment you can do them. And then the rest is, like I said, this car is going to go between here and there. It may go left, it may go right, because once it leaves the ramp, really all bets are off. Um, the car fell apart the moment it hit the ramp. Uh, the front right. left now, tire. Le so let me, because you you skipped over something. You you flipped some cars before. Because here's the thing that I find really interesting. You're you're going to be in a car accident. Yeah. And and you know you're going to be in a car accident. Yeah. Um, now, this car was made in the 70s. Did you, I'm assuming that you're not in the car's seat belts. No, no. With the, with, they literally built what is called a halo cage. It surrounded me and it had a ring that kind of pushes into the roof of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, with such a big, huge rooftop, we didn't want it to drag. We wanted it to be able to slide. You guys wanted to right. see it fly down the road. So uh, with that, it gave it kind of a, a hump in the roof and it works perfectly. But what that also does is structurally, uh, it supports the entire point that you're between the roof and where you're tied into. Right. So in even if the car did fall apart, the cage, you're in the cage and you're still safe. I'm still in the cage. And then inside the cage in a special seat, made for jumping that's uh, got flex and bounce to it uh, is a 4.5. I use a five point harness, meaning two shoulder straps. Uh, it comes down across the body and then one between the legs. Mm -hmm. And you just sit yourself down to a point where you're comfortable enough. You can breathe and move, 
but not enough that if the car does something you're ugly, bounce around. rolling, you're not getting ragdolled in the car. There is a ramp, mm -hmm. but when you hit the ramp, does something eject out of the car or is it? No, that would be for uh, what they used to call cannon rolls. Now they use a thing called a flipper. Uh, but think of a... A, a small tube. dolphin is ejected out of the bottom of Correct. a car. Correct. Uh, there's a tube that's uh, welded up underneath the car. And it used to have a black powder charge and a chunk of telephone pole. You've seen right. them in... And it's he, in Raiders. It's in Raiders when the truck. Yes. Yes, exactly. And it literally would launch this, yeah. this telephone pole stump out. Uh, that's so that if there's nothing in the road, why did the car roll? That's how you get him to turn over. Now they have a little paddle arm that literally does the same thing. It slams down on the road, causing the car to flip over and then it retracts and lays flat again. So you wow. never see it. Yeah. Wow. It's, the technology has gotten insane, but this is, you know, what, well, what I what we did. It's just yeah, how did you know that you how did you know that the ramp would flip the car? Like how did you know that the car <laughs> wouldn't just go up and then back down? Uh the ramp was by the way, isn't it funny that I didn't ask you these questions at the time? I still have pictures hey, of you. Fine. I still have pictures of you uh finally getting sleep in between yeah, that, was, that was awful. Uh it was it was well, what it was was it shh, it set the pace for everybody else. Uh, if you were going to work this hard, we were all going to work this hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's kind of yeah. how we all felt about it. But yeah. um, the ramp has what's called a kicker or, or a kicker tip on the end. Uh -huh. You can pick your angles based on the weight, the length of the car, certain measurements, weight, speeds. Uh, I chose a big kicker tip, big front end that has to come up. And we were worried that the back end was going to drag and it was going to do exactly what you said. Right. Up, and then slap down on the wheels and just look horrible. Yeah. Uh, so the kicker tip. And that would have wrecked the car too, I think. Oh, it completely would have wrecked the car. Yeah. We wrecked the car as it was. I mean, yes, I, go. Well, I will, for the Patreon people, I'll post the video of the car. <laughs> I have the raw footage of the car sliding and falling apart. Um, yeah. It's, but knowing that, you know, it's just another tool you use uh, for, for, certain aspects but but this one i got a really big reinforced you know you could have flipped the truck off of this thing and that uh -huh. was kind of what it was made for so that seven thousand pound station wagon we rolled over uh was gonna go as long as i had enough speed to get it to the top of that ramp it was gonna go right i had hoped to and get how more fast are you going when you go off that ramp uh i believe i was doing about 44 when i hit that ramp. okay uh, yeah. And we had discussed because we had, you know, again, the car wasn't perfect. I wasn't sure if it was 52 or 42 or 47. But after driving enough and doing speed runs, when you guys weren't there, I would drive down that road at right. 40 miles an hour and go, that's too much. Or, you know, that uh -huh. feels right. And then once we got the ramp up and did it with the car, uh, I just felt like the, the speed, whatever I needed, I knew how that felt. Right. So, right. But wow. I believe it was about 44 miles an hour. Here's a weird question. Sure. You're in the car. I'm assuming you can sleep the night before, or are you just too antsy? Uh, we had a lot of work that week. Right. This was on a, like a Friday last day of the yeah, episode yeah. kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, wow. we, th we thought if we killed you, we'd need to have shot you out. <laughs> I, I heard that rumor too. Uh, I think that was McGinley's idea. Oh, sorry, John. Uh <laughs> My wife's yelling at me to stop saying, ah, I, I apologize. I guess <laughs> I'll edit this. Great. Perfect. Uh, I didn't, that whole time frame. I think that last week, because I made a promise, I, I, I slept fine. Yeah. Cause you, and also we were just exhausted. I mean, like, we, we, yeah, just, we were all cooked. Yeah. We just like, but, if you stopped moving. You know? you know, right. Exactly. But, and so, but this, that wasn't even the question. So here's my question. You're on the ramp. Mm-hmm. The car goes up in the ramp. Do you, once you're airborne, for lack of a better term, do you close your eyes or do you keep them open? Are you able to keep them open? Yeah. I watched the landing and everything. Oh, that really? Was, yeah. Uh, I knew where I was the whole time, all the way through. It was actually, as soon as you feel that punch at the end, that thing that kind of pushes uh -huh. your front end right up in the air to allow the car to kind of turn over, spiral over, it's, you're weightless. I have a tendency, I guess, to just uh, on impact breathe out before that moment, just uh -huh. uh, kind of like that. 
uh, knew that wasn't going to slide off the road, which is a good thing because right. my, my worst fear was we did have cameras on both sides of the road. They were out of the way, but I just hate to, would have hated to put it in the woods. It really would have been rough to get it back out and still be able to shoot what we needed. And you hitting a tree, even though you're in a cage, you hitting yeah. a tree is worse than coming to a graceful, slow sliding stop. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, it came right over on the roof, big thump, and then sparks flying behind me. It's great. Right. Came down and obliterated the GoPro. We it had did. a GoPro, we the the GoPro the which is, yeah, we had a GoPro in the middle of the street <laughs> that we had the footage, but the camera itself yeah. did not. It was it. funny. Uh, you can hear the camera. I forget her name. Uh, the camera second AEC, I think she was, I can't believe you got the camera. It's basically what she was saying. <laughs> she used the colorful language. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then it, uh, it, it skids to a stop and then there you must feel th- such a, a relief like a crazy relaxation relief kind of like did that right uh yes the, that for sure the moment okay everything's i'm good wiggling right. fingers and toes i i felt physically i felt great nothing it was just a great smooth Mm-hmm. Ride. Uh, I would say it probably took me a good couple of hours after that for that adrenaline dump to to kind of wear off because I'm pretty sure I was running around like a puppy chasing his tail. Yeah, you were very stand. happy when you came out of the car. I Making was happy sure that you weren't dead, and you were very happy. Yeah. Um, well, so but every day, now I follow you on Instagram. You're Stunt Bob One. Yep. Uh, uh, on Instagram, every time I see you on Instagram, you're having another surgery. So it's it's not like, <laughs> it's not like you've emerged from this occupation scar free. What what have you what have you broken? What has been messed up in you? Fortunately for me, uh, one hospital trip at work, it was a car hit, uh, split the top of my head open, five staples, uh, just one of those things, bad happening. Uh, what happened? That, what happened? You The car was supposed to hit you? You were supposed to... Uh, car was supposed to hit me. Um, driver was going a little bit faster than we agreed on. Uh, we call it panic throttle. Uh, uh-huh. Sometimes you're near in that moment. Again, knowing the difference between 12 and 15 matters, uh, miles an hour matters. Right. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, and secondly, and this is an answer I don't know the reason to, and it was the first and only time we've ever done it this way, but I guess they were worried about me shattering the windshield. They really wanted to see it shatter. So they took the windshield out, put in a thin layer of Lexan in front of the driver. And then in front of that, they put taped candy glass. Right. They just, again, they wanted to see it shatter. And with the tape on it, I guess it holds it together more like a, a windscreen. Told me, you know, the worst thing that could happen, the Lexan may bounce you back off. Whereas a regular windshield doesn't have recoil. It just crushes in and that's it. Right. Uh, that didn't work. The good news is he was going a little bit quick. So I was not in front of him when I hit the car, like we had agreed. Mm-hmm. I was in front of the passenger seat. Uh, as soon as I went up on the hood, back of my head, hit the uh, the frame around where the window is. You think of a shoulder roll, You're right? Kind of rolling up onto one side. So I kind of caught it on the back left top of my head, uh, just right where the the roof line is. And do you know uh, it instantly? Or oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, it's one of those things that ten minutes later you're like, why am I? Now, the moment I hit it, I was it, it just you know it hurt, of course. But right. the, the the good news was I went straight through both layers of the candy glass, the Lexan, the Lexan shattered to pieces. Uh, I bounced into the passenger seat, uh, and the driver was smart enough to stomp on the brakes and spit me back off of the car when I rolled out into the street. So pop, 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 for the shot, salvaging the shot, shot. So you yes. wouldn't have to do it twice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I was, I was mad at because it didn't go the way we wanted to. And I, right. I you know, again, a bit younger, uh, and I was really frustrated that it, you know, I, I thought I'd done everything I needed to do to make it happen. And it didn't. Right. Uh, right. that, was, I understand that, yeah. that is just experience in the business. If you play with knives, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, the knee replacement three years ago was uh, the best way I can describe it is it's, it's a life well lived. Uh, when I, again, I was, when I, when I was in Colorado, that's where I met my wife. I was, uh, becoming, was it, was it a work injury or just, uh, no, just cumulative, cumulative, cumulative sure. uh, pounding and beatings and, um, you know, getting tackled and slammed into things and flipping cars. And no, you, I mean, you get over 40, uh, things happen. Well, I picked up a ladder wrong and blew out my rotator cuff. Yeah, it's amazing. Just and I lifted you know, a I, steel stepladder the wrong way. 
Yeah. And, uh, and the, it's, I, I, the one good news about that is it's equal. It doesn't matter if you work out three or four days a week. Uh, once you hit 40 plus, yeah, uh, we're all victims. Yeah, the doctor said, most people tear their rotator cuff. Yours exploded. <laughs> well, I'm an overachiever. What can I say? Doc? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was, so the knee replacement was just like, did that hamper your work? Are you still working just like normal or? Uh, just like normal now. I was pretty terrified. It was. When you told the doctor like, what you did for a living, it was like, oh, Christ. Well, I told the doctor what I did for a living, the surgery prior to that. <laughs> and at the six months, six months checkup, uh, still uncomfortable. Um, nothing seemed to have changed. And he comes in smiling and, hey, how are we doing? What yeah. part about what I do didn't you understand? <laughs> uh, his answer was, there's not much left to, to work with. Your next step is this or this. And uh, we had a good, long, serious talk about this could be a career ender for me. Right. At 50 years old, I don't think I was done yet. Uh, and I'm still working to keep it that way. Right. But was, it, was that the replacement or the replacement, replacement itself wasn't working? Oh, no, no. The replacement was great. It was the trying to salvage what was left of, of the, the cushioning knee. between the knees and mm -hmm. finding out that, you know, it's gotten so bad that the bones are now chewing into each other. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah that's what yeah. happens. You lose all the padding and then it just. Yeah. So, but now the new bionic knee, uh, and again, we talked for six months about it. And then when I found out, he kept saying, you know, these only last 20 years. And said, I don't understand how this titanium, you drop it on the floor in front of me and show me how strong and impervious it is. What wears out? And he said, oh, the little vitamin E infused disc that goes between the joints. I said, what do you have to do? Oh, I make a small incision, pull that out, tuck a new one in and three weeks you're back up and running. And I looked at him and said, so why are we waiting? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can I have all my really? limbs replaced? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so what, and in your, in your career, what is the biggest stunt that you've done? What's the one that you point to and you go like, I did that. You want to uh, want to know what I can do? I did that. The cannon roll is, is on my top three. Right. Uh, probably the biggest single, just man up kind of stunt, if you will, um, uh, we use air rams. They're miniature catapults. I have one. I think we use it on the show once or twice. Uh, it's You step on it and, it and it opens up. It throws you through the air. Right. Uh, this was for a show called The Vampire Diaries. Oh, sure. Well, I have daughters. Again. I'm very familiar with The Vampire Diaries. Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, so <laughs> Not only that, is... well, I went on The Vampire Diaries tour when we were down there. because that Covington, was, did you? That was what I had to bribe my kids with to come down. Come on down and we'll go on The Vampire Tour. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we did a, I did a backwards air ram, uh, standing on it with a button run down through my clothing that breaks away from the piece of equipment. A uh, young vampire actress grabs me by the collar and throws me backwards 16 feet through the air into the windshield of a parked police car. That was the single most, like, I didn't know you could get slammed that hard and not completely go unconscious. Really? Yeah. That's a, and you did you really is that the distance you traversed 16 feet and you're on a cable right no no this is jumping off of a ramp that is is flipping up it's uh -huh. accelerating okay upwards. you're being catapulted yeah i think of the the army movies where the guy tosses right. yeah, yeah. And all the bodies go flying it's that right. but uh, so i'm really, standing how do you know okay let, let, how do you know you're going to hit that windshield we rehearsed There's it be a until lot of math could, involved but there is uh physics really it's just all yeah. physics uh, we took the time, a solid day and a half to rehearse this. And then I think we spent another two and a half or three hours that day uh, while they were shooting the daylight stuff before we went tonight mm -hmm. to practice again. And the final thing I did was uh, just so I knew in my brain, I, I have this and I knew I had it. We made a pad stack that looked like a police car in the shape mm -hmm. of a police car. And I wanted a profile shot to give me that we could measure and look at. And so when right, I saw so the you profile knew at this shot, velocity at the speed, I'm going to go. Yeah. Through. So once I leave and see that I'm landing right exactly where the windshield is in the exact spot I want to land in at that point, I'd already done it seriously, probably a hundred times. So how high up at the highest point uh, in this, because the road was slightly sloped, I would say probably center mass 10 feet near. Oh, that's higher than I thought. Uh, literally a perfect arc that came dropped straight down. Uh, I hit the roof line right uh, 
right below where my, my shoulder line is. So about how much three padding are you in? I mean, a uh, huge spine protector. That's uh, you could get hit with anything with this. Uh, that spreads the load across your spine and your back, and your mm-hmm. lower hips, uh, shoulder pads, uh, hard shell elbows and forearms. And then on top of the pad, uh, under the wardrobe, we taped half inch um, nuts, like screws and nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, that hits the windshield first and it kind of cracks it. So it's a guaranteed windshield breaker. In other words, if you land too flat and you hit the roof frame, maybe you don't crack the windshield as much. So we put three of those on the back uh, so that when I hit it with my back, it'll destroy the windshield for sure. Wow. And what is the spine protector? What does that look like? Is it like a turtle um, shell or? Yeah, kind of like a turtle shell. Mm-hmm. Um, almost exactly. They're segmented. They come in different. Nowadays, the materials they're using are, uh, it, if you think of like a foam that you push on as nice and squishy and soft, uh, like the new memory foam beds. Mm-hmm. But if you punch it, it immediately becomes hard or dense. Uh, it's designed to take impact and spread it laterally instead of uh, forward. Instead of localizing the force. Yeah. Uh, the idea came uh, for Bulletproof Fest. They put this plate behind that would take that shock out of getting hit with a Bulletproof Fest. Because right, apparently right. early days, it was quite painful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, could, I would think. It could still break ribs and things. Whereas this yeah. thing, you take the you know the size of a nickel and you spread it out over the size of a football. I never thought about that, but yeah, like like a bulletproof. Even if you get hit in a bulletproof vest, you're, they always have a huge bruise or you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and it but better than a hole. So right now, uh, in the but, new. I'm, go sorry, ahead, I'm so, sorry. Go ahead. And so you said that was the hardest you've ever had an impact, and you stayed conscious. Was yeah. the thing that surprised you. Uh, Well, what we never factored in and through all of this, uh, uh, when I hit, we never thought that I would come in with such force. We figured I'd the windshield and be done with it. You know, roll over the director and ask, you're unconscious or whatever. But if you can roll off the car for us, that'd be great. Because we're now trying to splatter people against cars and kill them. (laughs) Okay, great. Are you conscious? Uh, So uh, I hit the roof line with my shoulders, like I said, and it immediately pulled my whole body open. Uh, everything from my groin to the bottom of my chin, I went me up. So my head snapped back really hard and pulled all of the muscles, everything from my hips to my sh- top of my shoulders. That was just, you know, cause you're tense, you're tight when you hit, you don't think that another body part continues moving. Well, my eight pound head kept going. That was what made it that part of the hardest hit. Did you hit the car with it or? Uh, we pushed the roof. We rumbled the roof. It looked like somebody had put, you know, dropped a big bowling did, ball. Did you have anything protecting it. your head, or uh, we did the rooftop, but not on my head. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. That's my what head I mean. landed on the flat part. Had I gotten lower in the windshield, that would have been an issue. But we knew that, you know, again, my shoulders were going to be up where the roof was. Uh, but we we pushed the we rumbled the roof back past the the bubble on the top. And we are you worried about like? Rep- repetitive head injury like the football players have or yeah um i've been on i've been knocked out would have been funny if you just went no mary like okay (laughs) (laughs) well as a matter of fact captain kangaroo i feel just fine (laughs) yeah there 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 have been moments and i know i've been unconscious on set uh that one was what they call a flash concussion Uh, Uh uh-huh the medic there, uh, who had known most of my career, parked me uh, as she said, "Your ass stays in this chair till I tell you you can leave." Uh-huh. And she monitored me for an additional four hours, and then right. made me call her when I got home from my drive from work. Uh, but yeah, there's you know you only have so many of those things in. You know, I had a knee replacement. You know, you only have so many sure. jumps, or drops, or crashes before right. you know. You, you, you yeah, I'm that. I'm fascinated by uh, evil Knievel. Although not a stunt man, like what he did, like what was left of that guy's body. <laughs> because also he wasn't, he was doing that with 1970s. Like one of the reasons that Evil Knievel, his records are being broken so easily now is because motorcycles are one sixth the weight. Yes. He was on these giant steel Harleys that weighed a ton. And yes. the poor guy, I, I think he did that. I guess he broke every bone in his body. He's broken everything probably twice. Yeah. Uh, but, God. And I, I, my wife and I joke that, you know, I told her, you'll be a doddering old fool. So you're going to forget 
me in the wheelchair. And so we're just going to lose each other in the wilderness at some point. <laughs> uh, but then she said, no, I don't want to have to push you around in a wheelchair. So please take care of yourself. Yes, exactly. That's no fun for anybody. <laughs> right. Uh, but, I, you know, I've been very fortunate, Dana, that the the you learn from the really nasty ones. Right. And some, some of the stuff that I tell some of the young stunt guys, you know, when you let them feel where the bones are broken here or from this thing there, it's okay to be durable. Uh, but don't be a punching bag your whole career. Right. And that must be an interesting thing. It's actually, I don't know if anybody's ever done that story as a film or whatever. Like, you know, the young, the young stunt guy who, you know, it's like thinks they can do anything. And you're like, yeah, no, I remember when I was you. Absolutely. <laughs> There's, I was talking to, uh, gosh, I think I was talking to Janet Varney, uh, who I was your friend and mine. Yes. Um, I was, I said, uh, uh, now that my future is behind me, it's I can just relax and have fun. <laughs> like <laughs> I know what's gonna happen. I mean, there's still plenty to do, and I could be surprised. But uh, yeah, I mean, I know how it works. I know how it works. I know I know what's gonna happen. And yeah. um, and when you're young, you know, when you're in twenties and thirties, it's it's all a big question mark. And oh, uh, I was bulletproof when I was that age. I mean, honest to goodness, I really thought that uh, until I I took my right shoulder completely out of the socket, <sighs> throwing front flips off of cliffs in the backcountry in Colorado. Um, I honestly thought I, I did they have it. to like jerk it up to put it back in. Uh, it took two doctors to put it in and sat out for two and a half hours. The, uh, it was never right after that. Uh, it's been a, if, if I've had an impediment in this business, that's been it. I've always been able to work around it, but there's certain things I don't do. Like I don't wrestle um, I don't do the grappling moves when it involves shoulders. Uh huh. Yeah. There's somebody shoulders. else that can do that. The grapplers and the fighters. And, uh, other than that, it's, it's been fine, but again, it's been something I've had to learn to work around ultimately, uh, in the business. Has stunt work, how is, how has CG affected stunt work for better or worse? Um, I, I would say for better. I think it enhances enough. Uh, I don't think it, if done right, it, takes away from the physical action you can do almost everything with cg uh there have been great amazing movies that are mostly cg uh that are just copies of human bodies jumping from pad to pad uh and then you insert forest city street you know whatever uh one of the great ones at the time i thought it was amazing was uh, benjamin button the car hit if you don't remember it i don't remember it now he literally gets bounced from off of one car into the next lane and gets clipped by another car. Um, and that was CGI. And oh, okay. it's fairly seamless and it looks great. It added to that scene, I think. Right. For me and personally. And like wire replacement is great. Yeah, um, exactly. We did, uh, State Against Evil, we did a ton of wire work. And it's, it's fairly easy, I think, nowadays for that to be taken care of. So we can still do these great gags. And nobody really sees how we did that. No. When you go to a, when you go to a movie, I'm assuming that you're. It's almost second nature that you're looking for the stunt stuff. Always, <laughs> yeah. Is the, have you? When was the last time you went to a movie and you were like, "God damn!" Because like you knew it wasn't CG, and you were just because I know what mine is from a writing point of view. I was, uh, I'm not sure which show. There's a group of guys. Uh, Sam Hargrave comes to mind that that their body of work from the Matrix on through the superhero stuff uh, is is it, wow. Sometimes yeah. there's, there's certainly moments in some of those shows that they're doing that are for sure wow. I know. To, yeah, to me it was, and again, I'm not a stunt person, but like the uh, Road Warrior Fury Road, mm -hmm. Mad Max Fury Road. Mm -hmm. The guys on the poles, they're sway poles. That I couldn't, I couldn't. And it, to me, I'm pretty sure it was real. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know, that just blew my mind. Like that guy, one, I'd never seen that before. And they're tr it was just, that was just phenomenal. It's funny you say that because now that I think about it, um, the Road Warrior, Mad Max, the second mm -hmm. one that they made, uh, there's a bike crash in it that the stunt coordinator, who's legendary in the business, uh, did and he hit this car on a motorcycle at 50, over 55 miles an hour uh, and it just caused him to completely pike upright into one layer of boxes uh, broke his leg beat himself up all up but it was when you see it you think that's got to be a dummy getting thrown like no it was him 
the centrifugal force from coming off of the motorcycle. When it instantly stopped and his head went forward, it just stretched his body out completely straight like a pencil till he hit the ground. And he died. And he, yeah. The, and he it just, just went into some, well, that's an Australian. He just, I right. think there's a box there. I'm not sure. I landed on a sandwich. Uh, he's, he softened up the soil a little bit under. We'll be yeah. Fine. I, God, I, there was a footage out here of a guy, not a stunt, uh, on a motorcycle doing over a hundred of not being chased by police cars, being followed by a helicopter. Oh no. Stolen a motorcycle, just followed by a helicopter. And he's going over a hundred in a suburban area. Somebody's taking a left turn. He T-bones it and he flew 25, 50, I mean, dead on impact. Yeah. Um, you know, he flew 25 feet in the air. Yeah. I can imagine like just it, it, the only thing you could hope for is instant death on landing. Yeah. I, he got it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, an hour it's, yeah. yeah. And yeah. The, like you said, the fortunately the footage is so far away. It's right. minimized. I'm sure it was but you gross. do look like, oh, I'm watching a guy's life end. Yeah. Well, he, he probably didn't stay together after that impact. I mean, it, it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you know, again, back to like you said, evil Knievel. He's doing this stuff on 800 pound motorcycles, 600 pound motorcycles. Yeah. Back in the day, big, uh, heavy, huge. Hogs. Uh, and figuring out ramp sciences, you know, now it's, there's formulas for it and, and there's, did there's he rigors. really figure out the ramp science or did he just roll with it? Oh, no, I think there's a documentary about him where they talk about the snake river Canyon jump and they're yeah. telling him about the G force and they're telling him the G force is going to knock him out. And he's like, ah, I'll be fine. Yeah. And Hey, guess what happened? <laughs> yeah. <it knocked> him. <laughs> yeah. I'll be, good. I'll be good. Uh, I'm in no, a jumpsuit and nothing can go wrong. Specifically, uh, the the ramp science came after him. You know, once somebody else started looking at this stuff and going, hmm, and talking to some of his engineers and the guys that, you know, just set these ramp angles and distances. And, uh, you know, Caesar's Palace is one of the most amazing, horrifying things to watch. And especially when you see it in slow motion. And you know who's running that camera? No. Bo Derek. No way. Mm -hmm. Her husband, I learned something new today. Her husband, John Derrick, yeah. was a photographer, was filming the jump for ABC Sports or whoever. Right. His wife is with him, not yet a movie star. And he gives her a B cam, like, just stand here and run this pointed at him and hit record. And that slow motion tumble, it's Bo Derrick. So you're, you know, you're, you're still working. You said you're on a break right now, but uh, do you know what you're doing for the rest of this year? Do you have, and are there still stunts? Like I, cause we talked about in the other interview, we talked about the stunt man that did the under the truck drag mm -hmm. on Raiders. Yeah. Famous. That he had tried that on the legend of the Lone Ranger and it didn't work. Right. And he brought the stunt idea to Ray. He's like, no, I really want to do this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, it was, that was, you know, it was, is there a, is there a stunt that you're like, I got to do this before I retire? Uh, I, by the way, the ones that always freak me out is getting set on fire. No, I've done a bunch of that. Oh, uh, God. Uh, I've been completely like invisible in fire. Yeah. Um, that's I've not... been invisible in fashion, but that's me. Well, I'm invisible in my career, but uh, that's kind of a goal. Um, the fire You're in a helmet and a face mask I, I would, and everything. I would really like to see what it's like to turn a vehicle over at speed, 70 miles an hour. Um, it's not something that at 53 is probably because I don't the do it. The smartest thing you could do. Often enough, or, or the smartest. I've always wanted to do a pirate movie. Never did get the chance to do anything like that. Uh huh. And I've never on film been... I'd like to come out of a helicopter, whether it's falling out of it or high speed rappel or <laughs> something like that. There's a funny story about the movie, The Living License to Kill, the second mm -hmm. Timothy Dalton Bond film. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Bond is hanging out of a helicopter and the producer, Cubby Broccoli, pulls into the set and sees Timothy Dalton hanging on the helicopter, not the stunt double. Like, what the fuck are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Tim, Tim wanted to do it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, typically, you know, not everybody gets to be Tom Cruise. Yeah, to do yeah. that. And do you th- do you do you foresee that you'll have an opportunity to do at least one of these? Uh, anything's possible. Yeah, that's anything true. is possible. Um, you know, for me, um, honestly, the highlight of my career was Stand Against Evil. It's what made oh, me realize. Nice. Well, Stand so Against clearly, you're not driven by money. No, no. <laughs> at this point, no. Uh, Stand was the reason I got in the film business is what I tell people. Cause when they say, what's your favorite show and why it was a good group. It, it was, you had some real talent in the room there and people that would have gone as far as you could take them with anything. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that, well, I, I hope that you, I hope that you get an opportunity to do these, but I hope <laughs> that's, but I'll be talk to you after. Um, uh, I have one last question, just personal. What was the name of the guy also named Bob? The the uh, uh, onset effects coordinator, the explosions guy, uh, Bob Shelley. Bob Shelley, is he still around? He is. I think he's doing a show down in Savannah right now. He's about a million years old now. He's about a million years old yeah. and is the single most fascinating human being I've ever met in my life. Yeah. We worked together for three years. Always lovely guy. And then one day we just happened to like both be doing nothing at the same time. And he just started telling me stories about being in Richard Nixon's Secret Service detail as a bomb guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's my the, jaw hit the floor. Like, what? Because he was a tunnel rat in Vietnam. Yep. He was and he was blowing ordinance. up ordnance. Yep. Yeah, that guy just had it all. Other podcasts reach for the sky. David Goldbaum. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out, boom.